Please be aware, in this podcast series, we talk about all areas of safeguarding, which some people may find upsetting. So please make sure you're okay listening to today's topic. Be mindful of those around you, such as children, that you might not want to listen in. Hi, I'm SSS Safeguarding Director Sam Preston. And I'm former head teacher and content author Sarah Spinks. Today we're diving into the latest research on the use of reasonable force and restraint in alternative provision and special schools in England. So let's start with some background. The Department for Education has been working to minimise the use of reasonable force, physical restraint and other restrictive practices in schools across England. So Sarah, could you give us a broad overview of this initiative and its significance? Yeah, sure. The initiative stems from the 2013 guidance titled Use of Reasonable Force, which was established to provide school staff with the necessary tools to reduce the necessity of using force and ensure that when it is used, it's done lawfully and safely. So the overarching goal is to create safer, more supportive learning environments for all students, particularly in special and alternative provision schools, where students might present more complex behavioural challenges. Mm, I mean, that sounds like a critical initiative, isn't it? I mean, I know recently the Department for Education commissioned qualitative research on this topic, and that research aimed to understand how reasonable force, physical restraint and other restrictive practices are currently utilised in special and alternative provision schools. I mean, the, the, the researchers, they wanted to identify effective strategies for minimising these practices. And um, so to achieve this, they conducted interviews with school leaders and staff from, I think it was about 45 special and alternative provision schools. And they also made site visits to four of these um, premises. And this combination of interviews and on the ground observations, that provided a, a comprehensive view of the practices and policies in place. And it is quite an extensive study, which I know you've looked at, Sarah. So maybe take the key findings. Yeah, well, the findings... Yeah, were indeed comprehensive. You know, firstly, all schools had detailed policies regarding the use of reasonable force, often embedded within those broader behaviour management policies. However, the research noted inconsistencies in the terminology used across the schools, which when uh, they were comparing practices, they found that quite challenging. Most schools did use the DfE guidance, but there were concerns about its sort of specificity and the relevance to the diverse context in which these schools operate. Gosh, that's interesting. So how did staff training factor into the findings? Well, staff training was highlighted as a crucial component. You know, external training providers played a significant role in shaping the culture and language around restraint and restrictive practices. However, financial constraints often limited the extent and quality of training that staff received. You know, schools emphasise the importance of personalised prevention and the de-escalation strategies that are tailored to individual student needs. You now, these strategies range from understanding specific triggers to using various distraction techniques to diffuse those potentially harmful situations. So prevention and de-escalation, you know, they seem to be key themes, don't they? How often did the research find that reasonable force was actually used? Well, the use of reasonable force was generally seen as a last resort, primarily to prevent immediate harm. Fully restraining students was rare. When force was used, schools were diligent, you know, in maintaining those records of these incidents, although the specific practices for recording varied quite widely. And this data was then used to inform and refine behaviour management strategies. So you mentioned variations in recording and reporting incidents. Can you elaborate on the challenges that schools face in in that sort of area? Yeah, well, certainly, you know, reporting practices varied significantly across schools. Incidents were typically reported to various stakeholders, you know, including parents, school governing boards and local authorities. 
However, there were concerns about potential misrepresentation of data, which could occur due to inconsistencies in how incidents were recorded and reported. And this inconsistency poses challenges in creating a standardised approach that accurately reflects the frequency and nature of these incidents. Right. Oh, gosh. So given these findings, the research identified several areas for further exploration. And one key area is the role and impact of training providers on school policies and practices. Another is the effect of removing certain stimuli on reducing the need for restrictive practices. Yeah, and additionally, the challenges associated with mandatory incident reporting need to be investigated, particularly regarding the variations in recording practices and the potential for data misrepresentation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, mm. you know, it's really critical, isn't it, for further research there. So as we wrap up, I'd just like to get some main takeaways for stakeholders listening who are looking to improve practices in special and alternative provision schools or indeed in any school. Yeah, well, I think the main takeaways are the importance of having comprehensive, consistent policies and the need for robust, well-funded training programmes. By understanding and addressing the diverse strategies employed and the challenges encountered, stakeholders they can work together to refine policies and practices this collaborative approach will help ensure safer sort of more nurturing learning environments for all students and especially those with special needs yeah absolutely well thanks for doing that sarah it's clear that while there are significant challenges there are also many opportunities to improve how we manage and support behavior in special and alternative provision schools just say from my perspective, it's great to see research driving best practice, you know, particularly in this area. Mm-hmm.